Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Blaine Bracky with uh, SDACD and the locally led project, which is a CCG with NRCS um, and the SDACD. Um, and this is the first webinar of four that we're doing. So we'll have um, three more of these uh, the following three Tuesdays of March. Um, but this is the first one we're having, which is the resource concerns in South Dakota. Um, and Jessica Mahalski with uh, NRCS is going to present for us today. Um, so with that, again, if you have questions, use the Q&A down at the bottom. Um, and if it's something that we can answer right in the moment on a particular slide or resource concern, um, we will try to get right to them. But without further ado, I'll let Jessica take over and we'll get this thing going. Okay, thank you so much, Blaine. Yeah. Uh, as Blaine said, I'm Jessica Mahalski. I'm the state resource conservationist for South Dakota NRCS. I've been in my role uh, for just over a year now. Um, prior to that, I have held uh, other positions with South Dakota NRCS, including uh, so conservation technician, uh, district conservationist in a couple locations. And most recently, I was the conservation stewardship program manager uh, for about eight and a half years um, prior to coming into my role with as the state resource conservationist. Um, so my role as the uh, SRC for sure is is really to um, provide the technical oversight for the NRCS staff in South Dakota. Um, on my staff is the state agronomist, state biologist, state rangeland management specialist. Um, so we uh, we are responsible for making sure that our technical standards are up to date, that we provide technical training um, to our, our field staff and so on and so forth. Um, so with that, Blaine had asked me to cover uh, resource concerns, an overview of resource concerns. And you know, obviously resource concerns are the foundation for our work at NRCS and our assistance to um, producers, but it, it, you know, this is, this is a topic that is pretty overwhelming. And so I hope that you will just utilize this as a, like I said, a, an introduction, an introduction and, you know, try not to get too wrapped up in the fact that there's, there's so many resource concerns, um, but really think about which ones you've seen out on the landscape, what are common in South Dakota and what can be done to address those resource concerns. So with that, um, at, we at NRCS uh, used to just look at what we called SWAPA. And that was resource concerns based on soil, water, air, plants, and animals. Um, more recently, we've added two more categories um, to resource concerns, and that is energy and the human component. Um, there are 18 resource concern categories that fall within the SWAPA E plus H. There are 50 resource concerns and there are 90 resource concern components. So as you can see, there's, I mean, this training of our of employees or our partners to identify resource concerns doesn't, definitely doesn't happen overnight. Um, it takes a lot of time out in the field, a lot of, um, viewing the landscape and seeing these different resource concerns to really get a handle on, um, on how many, you know, on, on how to identify them. So this is just a screenshot of um, the, one of the spreadsheets that we utilize to determine um, or to see the list of resource concern categories, resource concerns and resource concern components. And I, I just have, soil and part of water pulled up here, um, but you can kind of see how this lays out. This is the overall SWAPA category. Then we have the resource concern category, the individual resource concerns, and the components within those resource concerns. Some resource concerns, a lot of our resource concerns just have one component, as you can see here, um, but others have multiple components. Like if we look at nutrients transported to surface water down here. Um, 
we have both nitrogen and phosphorus surface loss, which are two components within these this resource concern. But for the purposes of today's discussion, I am going to keep it at the resource concern level. I'm not going to get down really to the component level. Um, because again, this is just an introduction and I wanna make sure that, that I provide a good overview to all of you. Um, I will take a uh, break after each swap a category to see if there's any questions in the chat and Blaine or Katie can, can communicate those to me if there are. So the first we're gonna look at is soil. And the category we're gonna look at is wind and water erosion. Um, so I wanna make this a little bit interactive. I can't see the chat, but I want people to um, be thinking about these research concerns. And so what I want you to be typing in the chat um, is I want you to, to think about these research concerns and think about solutions. So is there you know, either a conservation practice or some other solution uh, to these research concerns and type those in the chat. So Blaine and Katie can kind of look at those as we go along. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is sheet and rill er erosion. I'm sure we've all seen this on the landscape. It's the detachment and transport of soil particles, either by rain, melting snow, irrigation. Uh, what causes this? Bare, unprotected soil, soil disturbing activities, uh, long slopes. Those are all causes um, to uh, sheet and rill erosion. So what are some what are some solutions? Um, hopefully you guys are typing some solutions in the chat, um, but there's a lot of solutions for sheet and rill erosion. Um, reduction in tillage or switching to a no-till system. You, utilizing a, a crop rotation with higher residue crops. So instead of you know, continuous soybeans, for example, do we, are we utilizing corn? Are we putting a small grain with more residue into into the rotation, those types of things. Uh, we can do some cover crops, we can do contour farming or, or buffer strips, those types of things. Um, those are all solutions to sheet and rill erosion. The next is wind erosion. Um, unfortunately, we're still seeing this out in the landscape. You know, um, this, this wasn't taken from the dirty 30s. This is a recent photo, I think, from Blaine. Um, so we're still seeing this out on the landscape. And, and what is it? It's the detachment and transport of soil particles by wind. Um, again, what, what are some causes of wind erosion? Um, increased tillage, bare soil, uh, less residue, um, decreased infiltration um, from poor soil structure. What are some solutions to wind erosion? Um, I, you know, many of you know that that one of the greatest solution for wind erosion is is planting of windbreaks. Uh, again, residue and tillage management, um, cover crops. Again, crop rotations with high residues. All those things help with wind erosion. Okay, um, in the concentrated erosion category, ephemeral gully erosion. Um, it's soil erosion that results in small gullies, as you can see here in the photo. It's again caused by bare, unprotected soil, soil disturbing activities. What are some solutions to this? Um, there's a lot of good solutions out there. A lot, you know, a lot of them have to do with reduction in tillage, crop rotations, uh, grassed waterways planting permanent cover, um, all those things are, are great solutions for ephemeral gully erosion. Classic gully erosion. Uh, classic gullies are, uh, the difference between ephemeral gully and classic gully is really when you look at classic gully, that's something you can't drive your equipment through. Um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna take your tractor through this, this gully, this classic gully. Um, again, Many causes to this, bare unprotected soil, poor soil structure, um, reduced infiltration. So you've got increased runoff of water and reduced infiltration. Uh, large storm events can sometimes, ca sometimes cause these 
classic gully erosions. So what are some solutions? Um, again, reduction in tillage, residue management, or leaving more cover on the soil. Grass, uh, a lot of times when it gets to this point, we're gonna be installing a grass waterway. Um, so we're going to um, you know, work with the producer to, to survey, this in, survey this land, um, design a grass waterway that will meet the needs of this, of this producer. Again, concentrated erosion category, bank erosion. See a lot of this um, out on the landscape. Erosion from poor land management practices or just, just the simple fact of waves, wave action, um, storm events, rain, you know, all of those types of things cause bank erosion. So what can we do? Um, we can put in you know, here again, uh, we have a lot of plantings, riparian area plantings that we put in. So whether we are putting in uh, uh, trees along this bank or whether we're actually going through the work to rebuild this, this shoreline um, to protect it, to put in um, in-stream structures or to, to um, you know, put vegetation um, in along these banks. Those are all solutions to, to bank erosion. Okay, so we, we, our first category really talked a lot about soil erosion. Now we're gonna jump into soil quality. Um, subsidence, uh, you, a lot, we get a lot of questions um, of, as far as what subsidence is. And it's just the loss of volume and depth of organic soils due to oxidation um, caused by above normal microbial activity. But we don't have this resource concern in South Dakota because it is only applicable when soils are histosols. And since we don't have any histosols in South Dakota, this is not a resource concern that we consider here. Um, but I wanna make sure that I cover that because you will see it in lists and um, information on resource concerns. Now compaction is something we definitely have um, here in South Dakota. And compaction is just, is generally management induced and it, um, it reduces plant productivity. It reduces the, the ability of water to infiltrate into the soil and it, it causes a reduction in aeration of the soil. So what are some causes of compaction? Well. Definitely heavy machinery, um, traffic on wet soils, working, um, whether you're tilling or grazing wet soils, those, all those things can cause uh, compaction. Also poor aggregation and low organic matter um, can cause compaction. So what are some solutions? I hope, again, I hope you're typing in the chat. What are some solutions to compaction? Um, reducing traffic or tillage operations. Uh, one of the new practices that my staff has been working on is called controlled traffic, where you actually try and limit the, um, the patterns across the field to uh, certain widths and certain areas. So you're not actually driving equipment um, over the whole field. It's just a, um, you know, making sure we, we consider traffic patterns and planning for those. Um, and that's one thing that, that we're working on is to get uh, a spreadsheet put together to help producers that might be interested in doing that controlled traffic practice. Organic matter depletion. Uh, this, this picture here shows um, the difference between, it's the same soils and it about taken about a hundred yards apart, it shows the same same soils with different management. So the one on the left is native prairie and the one on the right has been hayland for approximately 50 years. So you can definitely see that um, on the right, the, the organic matter has really been depleted over the years. Um, what are some causes? Uh, soil disturbance, um, low crop biomass. So if you think about, you know, if we're, we're haying an area um, for uh, many, many years, we're just removing residue over and over again. And what are we putting back on that soil? Um, you know, probably not much residue. So 
you know, that really can cause a reduction in soil organic matter. Um, what are some solutions to increasing or, or building organic matter? Um, utilizing cover crops is definitely one that we've um, really seen take off here in the last several years. Diversifying our crop rotation, uh, going to a no-till system, uh, applying nutrient management or, or applying uh, nutrients in a, in a recommended rate and time, prescribed grazing, all those types of things can help us increase organic matter. Concentration of salts or other chemicals. Um, this is a, you know, this is a, a resource concern we deal a lot with. You know, we have uh, many kind of projects going on in the James River Valley that, that are focused on this resource concern. Um, and it, it, you know, a lot of it is caused by uh, decreased infiltration in the soils, inadequate drainage to leach the salt from the soil. Um, the salts actually are migrating from shallow groundwater um, up to the surface. What are some solutions? Well, um, definitely if it comes to irrigation, the proper use of irrigation water, salt tolerant crops, uh, removing excess water from recharge areas, um, you know, planting these areas down to perennial vegetation that, that can, you know, remedy this situation is, is one of the best ways to, um, to provide a solution for this resource concern. All right, soil organism habitat loss or degradation. Um, you know, this is something that, that we've really been focused on lately in South Dakota. Um, the, the, the soil health and the soil structure, um, we've really, you know, done a lot with this and trying to encourage producers to think about this um, on their operations. So what are some causes? Again, soil disturbance, conventional tillage, um, burning or harvesting or removing crop residue. This can all have a, a huge impact on soil quality. Um, what are some solutions? Again, diverse crop rotations, cover crops, no-till systems, um, nutrient management um, on the grassland side of things, prescribed grazing, so leaving more, more residue on our grazing lands can definitely help improve soil organism habitat. All right, aggregate instability. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen um, the slake test um, and you know to determine kind of what that aggregate stability is on a given uh, pet of soil. And um, so you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, obviously this, this soil has really good aggregate stability. And on the right-hand side, it's, it's really um, unstable as far as the aggregates are concerned. Um, again, what are some causes? Soil disturbance, um, removing crop residue. What are some solutions? Cover crops, no tilling, nutrient management, prescribed grazing, uh, irrigation water management, all those types of things can help to improve aggregate stability of soils. Okay, with that, I'm gonna take a break before I head into the water uh, swap a category and see if there's any questions in the chat. Blaine, Katie? So we had a few back in the um, erosion, just um, okay. some of the solutions. Um, and you kind of mentioned most of them do not work the soil, only use no-till um, with wind erosion leave uh, seed or leave grass along the fence line, use no-till, um, keep cover crops on the ground, um, no-till again, and then one question on the, or I guess statement or question on the big um, classic gully was would be creating a wide grassed waterway. That would be yep, possible. Absolutely, absolutely, yep. Um, and then we had um, one possible solution, like a tree belt for erosion. Yep. 
Absolutely. Great. Any questions? None so far. Maybe they're wildly typing away. Okay. All right. Well, we can we can yep. pause after water after the water category and see if there's any more. So, um, so water, uh, water resource concern, obviously, um, very, very important, not only, you know, within state, but on a national and global scale. Um, you know, I don't have as many pictures for the water resource concerns because I think, you know, many of you are obviously familiar, you know, with, with these resource concerns and probably have seen them out on the landscape more ponding and fl flooding um, <laughs> dealt with it, you know, obviously deal like deal with this in, in cycles usually um, a couple years ago, obviously it was a major issue in much of the state. Uh, this year it might not be <laughs> as much of an issue. So, um, but it basically is just, um, you know, areas that, that pond and flood that maybe normally wouldn't. Um, some of the causes, decreased infiltration, um, just the fact that you have a flood prone area, you know, is, uh, is a cause, but what are some solutions? Um, drainage management, uh, structures for water control. So we, we do have uh, a lot of individuals throughout the, throughout the state installing uh, drainage. Um, but I think one thing that sometimes we, we forget is that we can really do a lot of uh, structures to control that that water. So instead of just installing tile, for example, and uh, and letting it run, we could actually install structures that allow us to to kind of sh well, basically shut that off and on. So when we need the water to keep the water on the land, and when you know there's excess water to to let that water out of those tile systems, and I think that's that's one thing that we need to continue to educate producers on if they're going to install drainage is that that really is a great solution um, to help with water management. Seasonal high water tables, um, just, you know, groundwater that's, that causes saturated conditions. Um, again, we can, we can manage that with, with surface or subsurface drainage practices. We can implement wetland um, restorative and enhancing practice, practices. So those are those are solutions to seasonal high water table. Uh, seeps. Um, seeps are indicated by little to no established vegetation due to excess water, wet areas, restrictive soil layers. Um, they're caused by high water tables, just natural soil conditions cause seeps. Um, again, some of the solutions are to restore or enhance wetlands, um, drainage management, tree plantings, uh, windbreaks that, that use water and um, can, can help with, with seeps as well. Drifted snow, I didn't think I needed a picture of drifted snow because we've all seen that. Um, but, you know, what are some causes? Obviously, um, you know, blowing snow, will encounter a, a barrier and, and you know, drift in those locations. Um, so what are the solutions? Obviously, one of our favorite solutions is living snow fences. So it's, it's a tree planting um, designed to act as, as a snow fence to protect other structures, to protect roads, those types of things. Um, conservation tillage can help also with drifted snow. Obviously, um, having, you know, very tall stubble will catch a lot of snow as well. Naturally available moisture. Um, this is just natural precipitation and it's not optimally managed uh, to support the desired land use grazes or land use goals, excuse me. Um, so some of the causes, again, traditional tillage, overgrazing of areas, um, so some of the solutions can be using reduced tillage, no-till, um, those types of things, increasing soil organic matter um, to enable more infiltration. Surface water de depletion. Um, water is collected from precipitation and, and runs off. Um, the causes are um, we're using surface water at a rate greater than the surface water 
um, body can replenish itself. Um, some of the causes are that we were actually draining um, surface water and this negatively impacts wildlife habitat a lot of times. So we can implement conservation practices that um, develop and replenish these surface water resources. Um, we can convert from lower to higher efficiency irrigation systems. Those types of things can all help with surface water depletion. And the same, same uh, kind of cause, causes and solutions for groundwater depletion. So we're actually, you know, this is something that's, that's kind of a hot topic, um, especially in um, our neighbor to the south in Nebraska is, is groundwater depletion or utilizing the aquifers for irrigation faster than they're, they're recharging. Um, so what, you know, what are some solutions to groundwater depletion? Um, again, we can utilize higher efficiency systems for, for irrigation systems. Um, those types of things really make a difference when it comes to depleting our groundwater. And then what falls in line with, with this also is the inefficient irrigation water use, which is another resource concern that we consider. Um, it's just irrigation water isn't, isn't being utilized. It's not um, being stored or delivered, scheduled or applied efficiently. Um, you know, some of the causes is still having open earthen irrigation ditches. Um, irrigation water is sometimes allowed to run off the fields. Um, over irrigation um, causes issues. So what are some of the solutions? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen where irrigation systems have converted from, you know, shooting the water up in the air to a, a drop system. And that's, that's made a huge difference in efficiency of irrigation, um, irrigation water use. Okay, this is one, you know, obviously that we, that we see quite often, um, or at least hear about quite often, um, is nutrients transported to surface water and groundwater. Um, you know, both of these are impacting, you know, al algae blooms, they're impacting hypoxia zones in the Gulf of Mexico. This is something I think that we're gonna need to consider to, you know, consider and work together to improve um, over the coming years. And we've done a lot in, in this way. You know, we have a lot of producers with comprehensive nutrient management plans to help address um, nutrient application. So what are some causes? Obviously overusing fertilizer or over applying manure is probably one of the major causes uh, to this resource concern. And what can we do? You know, we can, we can work with producers to have comprehensive nutrient management plans, to plant cover crops that utilize excess nutrients, to make sure that we plan our crop rotations appropriately um, to utilize excess nutrients. And then also, um, you know, thinking about organic applications and manure applications um, to, impacting water quality. Um, again, if we don't properly collect um, or handle or store manure or compost, you know, that obviously can contribute to field, uh, field loss and decreased water quality. Um, and then along with that, sediment transported to surface water. Um, it's not just nutrients that are impacting surface water but also, you know, just the, just the sediment or the soil that we lose that goes to surface water. Um, again, causes are bare, unprotected soils, long, steep slopes, decreased infiltration, all of that impacts um, nutrients and sediment being transported to surface water. So what can we do? Um, again, improved residue management, crop rotations with high biomass crops, um, you know, planting cover crops, putting in grassed waterways, putting in terraces, all those things can make a difference. Windbreaks, again, um, can definitely impact sediment um, being transported to surface water. All right, and now we jump into the category of field pesticide loss. Um, you know, not only do we need to be concerned about our nutrients and our 
and our sediment that's being lost. We also need to think about what pesticides might uh, lose. So what are some causes? Um, you know, utilizing um, lower, uh, you know, not as high technology for spray, you know, something that doesn't, you know, that, that allows there to be drift um, with spraying, those types of things can all can all play a part in field pesticide loss or pesticides transported to either surface water or or groundwater. So, what are some solutions? Um, you know, some of the big solutions actually, you know, are on the technology side. There's there's drift reducing nozzles. There is um, the ability to to shut off certain certain sprays so that we don't have overlap, certain nozzles, excuse me, that we don't have overlap. Um, we can put in buffers, vegetative buffers uh, along surface waters to, to prevent any uh, pesticides getting into those surface waters. Okay, and I did discuss the, you know, I, you can see here that, well, hey, we already saw nutrients transported to the surface and groundwater. Um, yes, you did under the under the category of field sediment, nutrient, and pathogen loss, but we also have a category storage and handling of pollutants. So the difference between, you know, the, the, really the resource concerns are the same, but the difference of the categories is that one is the field application of nutrients, and this is the actual storage and handling of those nutrients. So in, in this case, if we're looking at, for example, um, a manure, manure storage or, or fertilizer storage. Uh, we really need to think about what, what problems that could happen and how those could affect our surface and groundwater qualities. Um, and then, you know, another thing is, is petroleum and other pollutants that, that we store on farm um, and thinking about uh, how those could impact water quality. Um, some of the causes are just, you know, not having the right storage or um, unprotected surface water sources. Um, all those could, you know, could uh, contribute to this resource concern. So some of the solutions are, are making sure that you have the proper storage and handling um, facilities, making sure that Petroleum and chemical containment systems are up to snuff, those types of things. And then also thinking about, um, you know, planting maybe some buffers or having some application setbacks um, can be potential solutions for this resource concern. Um, and then also that that as well can impact groundwater, not just surface water. Um, so again, making sure that those storage, storage, um, and handling um, facilities are, are what they need to be and that they can protect groundwater, that there's no leaks or anything like that. Okay, salts, salt losses to water. Salts can be transported to either surface water or groundwater. Um, they, you know, these can, these can naturally occur in soils, but they can also be caused by inadequate drainage or application of saline water to land. Um, some of the solutions, uh, again, proper use of irrigation, um, you know, making sure that we're utilizing that irrigation water appropriate or planting salt tolerant crops. Um, you know, those that can really help with, uh, with this resource concern. Okay, I'm going to stop there again and see if there's any questions on the water resource concerns. We have zero questions on the water. Okay. So did we have any solutions? <laughs> or did well, I go, you know, I, I feel like I'm going through this kind of fast, but uh, yeah, I only have an hour. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's not too fast. No, I think I think you're doing you're doing great. I think uh, yeah, you're answering a lot of questions kind of as they come up. Okay, good. All right. Um, and this is, so I'll go into the air um, category. And this is one where I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on at all. Um, generally speaking, in South Dakota, 
we don't spend a lot of time uh, on air quality resource concerns. Uh, we don't have regulations in place. Now, that being said, who knows what's coming, uh, what's coming down the pipe? I mean, obviously, this, this could be something where we need to pay more attention in the future, where we need to focus more of our energy and more of our focus as far as conservation practices. Um, but I just want to touch base on, you know, some of on the resource concerns that are in, you know, that, that affect air quality. Um, obviously, we have isolated um, incidents of, of air quality issues. And, and I'm sure you're all aware of that and have seen, you know, seen that. Um, the, the first one, the, the emissions of particulate matter and precursors, um, this, this could be dust, smoke, chemical and fertilizer use, animal activities, um, any of that. Some of the solutions, um, again, windbreaks are great for air quality emissions. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the ability to treat uh, roads. There, um, uh, you know, there's, there's people that, that like to treat their, their uh, gravel roads and those types of things to reduce dust. And then also just, you know, residue management again. Um, you know, if we've got that residue and we're not tilling the soil, then we're not having dust issues. Um, emissions of greenhouse gases, um, some of the causes, nitrogen application, again, conventional, conventional tillage, uh, methane production from animal operations, all of those can contribute to, to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, you know, our, what we do out on the landscape, reducing our tillage, um, proper manure management, all those types of things can help um, remedy this resource concern. Uh, ozone precursors, um, some of the causes are, are just combustion or engines, um, animal operations, pesticide applications, um, some of the solutions, um, you know, our integrated pest management, uh, smoke management, all those types of things can Feed and, feed and manure management, um, all of those help uh, improve the emissions of ozone precursors. And objectionable odor. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is one we've all experienced. Um, drive by a feedlot or a confined, uh, another confined animal feeding area and, and you definitely can, can pick up on this resource concern. So, um, you know, what, what can we do about odor? I think, you know, the biggest thing that we've seen is is uh, if you you're putting in an animal feeding operation, is is you know plant plant some trees around it. Um, you know a lot of times people say that we smell with our eyes more than we do our nose, and I, I think that definitely could be true. Um, so I think that's one of the the biggest things that we can do, and and also um, just making sure to properly apply nutrients um, can make a difference as far as odor resource concern is. Um, Emissions of airborne reactive nitrogen um, causes nitrogen application, again, combustion or engines, animal operations. Um, one of the biggest solutions is to apply nitrogen appropriately at the right place, the right time, the right amount. Um, feed management, manure management can all uh, help to reduce the emissions of airborne reactive nitrogen. I think I'm just gonna keep rolling here, Blaine, um, moving on to plants. Um, you know, this is something that, uh, <laughs> that we've all seen, plant pest pressure. Um, this is probably one of our most visual, uh, besides our soil resource concerns, this is probably one of our most visual resource concerns. And this is something not many people uh, miss. You drive by a pasture and it's full of thistles and uh, you, yeah, you don't, you don't generally miss that. Um, what are some of the causes? Um, well, overgrazing, you know, typically um, plays a large part in, in plant pest pressure um, or, you know, just not, not uh, applying pesticides or, or doing some other kind of management to control the weeds. Um, what are some solutions? Um, obviously using um, a, a prescribed grazing system, um, utilizing pest management, um, whether that's uh, spray, you know, spraying or um, 
utilizing livestock um, to, to graze the invasive species, whatever. Um, and then also um, just making sure that um, you're using local source identified seed of native species. So you're not actually bringing weed seeds back into the environment or, or when you're planting, um, planting land back to perennial vegetation. Degraded plant condition. Here's a great, great photo to, to show the difference between a degraded plant condition and a, a not degraded plant condition. Um, you know, what are some of the causes? Uh, again, overgrazing, um, plants, you know, having plants planted that aren't adapted to the site. Um, you know, all those types of things can really make a difference. Um, so what do we do for a solution? Uh, again, a prescribed grazing plan in this in this scenario. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about this resource concern on on cropland, we're talking about considering a crop rotation or um, deep rooted crops that will that will are suitable to the to the site. Um, making sure that we you know maybe this maybe we need to do a prescribed burn on this site to to help um, encourage the native plant species to come back. All of those types of things can be possible solutions to uh, the degraded plant condition. Structure and composition. Uh, you might be looking at this photo and going, well, that, that doesn't look like a resource concern to me. Um, but this is a picture basically of smooth grown grass. So, um, you know, obviously that's, that's an invasive species and not saying that, that it can't be managed appropriate at, appropriately and utilized in a, in a grazing system, but it also isn't the, it isn't the, the uh, species that we should see on this ecological site. Um, so there's maybe some, some different things here we can do um, as far as solutions are concerned. Again, maybe a prescribed burn, maybe um, planning our grazing management um, in the spring to, to uh, you know, to kind of knock out the smooth grown grass and, and then pull this, pull the animals off and maybe see if there's some native species that would come back into this, into this system. Those are some potential solutions to degraded plant condition. Um, in the category of fire management, uh, wildfire hazard from biomass accumulation. And yeah, I've got a picture here of uh, biomass accumulation in forests, but obviously this can also happen on our grazing land or in our cropland is there can be you know, too much residue that can cause um, issues with um, too much biomass. And if there is a, there is a fire, obviously there's, there's plenty of fuel here um, to let that, let that fire go. Um, so what do we do? Well, um, in a forest situation, we can thin excess trees and brush. We can um, remove the, the vegetation on the forest floor. Um, we can create and implement a wildfire plan, um, all those types of things. Um, we can also, you know, in a grassland scenario, maybe we want to do a prescribed burn um, so that we're burning it on our, you know, when we want to do it and, and uh, when we can control it versus something that would get out of hand. Okay, in the animal category, um, just a few resource concerns that, that we look at for, for animals. Yes, Go ahead, Blaine. Yep. Just one quick question. Um, sure. On the brome seeding, uh, when would be the best time to do a pres prescribed grazing um, to possibly decrease the brome but increase the native warm season grasses? That's a great question. Um, generally, well, what we've seen is that if, if you do that really early in the spring, like as soon as that brome grass is starting to green up and you, you graze that pretty hard for about a month or so, and then about, you know, the, the warm season species really kind of take off about the middle of June. Um, so if you graze that really hard, um, you know, maybe from May 1 to June 1 or June 15th, and then pull animals off of there, a lot of times you'll really see that native component start to come back. Perfect, awesome, thank you. Yep, you bet. Okay, in our animal category, um, feed and forage balance. This is something that we have a lot of discussions with producers on. Uh, it's not necessarily something you can see, 
although if you know if there's not much plant residue left after grazing you you obviously kind of know that there's there's a feed and forage imbalance there um, but really we we like to do uh, grass clippings we like to measure um, grass residue those types of things and then we also utilize a lot of information when it comes to our soils and um, our grass production to determine you know the number of animals that would generally um, be you know should be grazed on a particular pasture or uh, groups of pastures or whatever so there's a lot of different tools that we can utilize at, at NRCS and partner staff I know have have uh, have utilized to help a producer determine if if they have a, a feed and forage balance is correct or whether they need to adjust animal numbers um, change grazing dates those types of things um, the inadequate livestock water quantity, quality, and distribution. Again, this is maybe something that isn't real visual as far as a resource concern, but if you start looking at a producer's operation and where they have watering facilities um, or what type of, you know, what they have for, for watering, um, maybe if they have dugouts, you know, maybe the quality is an issue. If they've got a tank that's a mile or a half mile away from, from you know, the center of the or the other end of the pasture, you know, maybe there's a distribution issue. So definitely a resource concern that, that we consider a lot in our grazing systems. Inadequate livestock shelter. Um, unfortunately, we, we know too well um, what, this can, what this can do and the devastating effects that, that this resource concern can have on, on our producers in South Dakota. Um, you know, on the, on the top picture there, Cows are kind of left left in the elements, and in, in the bottom picture, um, they're pretty happy where they're at. Um, so obviously, one of the the best things to do is to um, you know put it put up uh, windbreaks or shelter belts. Um, we also obviously have you know it doesn't have to be a living you know uh, tree planting that we do, but we also have. Um, plenty of materials that can be used to build uh, windbreaks as well. Uh, terrestrial habitat. So this is basically, you know, land habitat for, for our terrestrial species. Um, again, not something maybe you can always visualize or see out on the landscape, but when you start looking at, um, you know, if there's existing wetlands or if that wetland cover has been destroyed or, or they producers worked it up, um, you know, that, that can decrease uh, wildlife habitat or maybe it's very fragmented habitat. So you've got, you know, a lot of cropland and it's just cropland um, and there's no intermixing of grasslands or anything like that. Um, that can definitely play a role in this. So what, what can we do? We can add, shelter features, whether it's, you know, um, planting trees, um, you can leave portions of your crop fields unharvested. Obviously, we have a lot of producers that are doing that, um, that leave those food plot areas for, for food and habitat for wildlife. You can add um, herbaceous buffers. Uh, so planting of grass, trees, shrubs, all those types of things can help improve this resource concern. Aquatic habitat, um, you know, this isn't something that, that we probably plan um, a lot for, but, you know, we want to make sure that we have good um, habitat for our, our um, aquatic species as well. So, you know, whether we're, um, solution would be to restore or enhance wetlands. Um, uh, maybe, again, planting some trees or shrub buffers along water bodies, all of that can be a solution for this resource concern. Elevated water temperature. Again, not one we really consider much in South Dakota because we don't have too much problems with it. But um, if it's, you know, if you've got surface water that's, that has direct sunlight constantly, you know, this could be an issue. Uh, we can install uh, again, trees along these areas or, or other herbaceous uh, buffers. All right, um, again, uh, the, the two kind of resource concern categories that have been added recently are, one of those is energy. Um, so we've started looking at uh, inefficient energy use um, and 
energy efficiency of equipment and facilities, and also field operations. So, you know, some of the causes are, um, you know, inefficient pumps, heat losses from buildings, uh, those types of things, unnecessary trips across the field or, at, or applications of commercial fertilizer, all of that can contribute to energy efficiency. Um, so, so what are some of so the solutions? Um, we can replace uh, low efficiency systems with higher efficiency systems, high efficiency pumps. Um, we can use LED lighting, uh, those types of things. Um, we can also implement, um, implement a pest management system or converting to minimum or no-till that can all impact energy efficiency. And then the last uh, resource concern that, that we're considering is, is the human considerations. You know, that is really, you know, one of the biggest um, things that we need to consider when we're planning with producers. Um, and a couple of those that we're looking at are a threat, the threat of conversion. So, you know, a lot of times when we're re-enrolling CRP, um, you know, we might not have another resource concern out there, but we're thinking about the producer converting that grassland back to uh, cropland and what what impact that could have on the resource or or just that there's a loss of the functions or values of of the land um, we need to consider um, pressures from you know development uh, that's a lot that we're looking at that in a lot of um, areas especially around the Sioux Falls area and the Rapid City area um, we need to make sure that we're listening to our clients and thinking about, you know, what's important to them. Um, thinking about the management system that they want to that they want to implement um, and what those actions could mean to not only the resource concerns that we talked about in all the other categories, but the human um, consideration as well. So with that, uh, I went over 45 minutes pretty easily. Um, but, and I know I went through that fast again, um, I hope it provided a good introduction to all the resource concerns that we consider um, and should be considering. And with that, I will open it up to any last minute questions, or comments or anything. Um, we did have one question here. Can we get a copy of this presentation, Jessica? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Perfect. Yes. It'd be a good review because like I said, I went I went through everything pretty fast. Um, I do have a lot of information in the notes section. So hopefully that would help you um, as well. Um, and then um, I don't know if you want me to just send this to you, Blaine, but there's also um, NRCS has put together resource concern fact sheets um on all of these resource concerns they are a very 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 useful tool um and i would encourage um you to to print off the the common ones that you're that you will be considering or, or are considering and um and you know have those handy as well great um and i'll, I'll also make a note too that we have um some of the photos that you used were part of a um, photo project that we did last summer um, and we're we're just getting that finished up but I do have um, 120 or so photos that we have that are all of resource concerns with with really detailed descriptions that I will also send out um, to everyone that was part of this today so hopefully that helps some too um, perfect yes yeah. Um, any other questions before we wrap it up? And I will send out this um, this recording also to everybody once I figure out how that works and <laughs> where where it's saved. Um, but we'll get it out to everybody. Um, yes, Tammy, the photos. Tammy was just wondering if photos can be posted on a website. They will be up on. It'll be on NRCS's Flickr, um, and you will be able to. You can basically use them as you see fit. So if you want to post them on a website, if you want to print them off, um, if you want to use them in any uh, brochures or postcards or whatever, um, 
you can absolutely use them. They're just kind of whatever you think you can use them. Um, but if there's no further questions, um, I guess thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thanks, Jessica. That was that presentation was great. I think resource concerns is pretty. It can be pretty complex. <laughs> so I think. Yeah, you it, and you know, and the other thing I'd like to say is, if any of you you know want a, additional training on you know on resource concerns or anything like that, um, please please feel re, you know free to reach out to me. I know. I've had a lot of been able to have a lot of good discussions with conservation district um, employees over the past couple weeks and um, really want to just continue to strengthen our partnership between South Dakota NRCS and all, all of our partners that help us do, do the great conservation planning work that we do. Um, you know, want to make sure that you are all getting any training or any materials that that will help you. Um, as well. So just make sure that you reach out to me and um, I might not be able, I, I, my, I found my position is kind of busy, but, <laughs> um, but I, I'll always take the time to get back to somebody. So. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Jessica. Um, you bet. If anybody has any further questions, you can yeah, email Jessica, email me, um, and we'll help find an answer. But um, if that's all the questions, uh, that's it for this week. We have, we'll have another one, um, the three following Tuesdays of March. Um, I think next week we're doing print materials and social media. Um, so those of you that are interested in that, um, join us next week at the same time and I'll resend the links um, so you can make it to those, but um, I guess otherwise, I think we are good to go. So thanks again, Jessica. And thanks, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.